It was a nice summer day. My five-year-old son James was playing outside in the backyard of our suburban home. James has always been a quiet boy. He plays by himself mostly. He never really had any friends, but he has always had a wild imagination. I was in the kitchen feeding our dog Fido when I heard a son like James talking to someone in the backyard. I'm not sure who it was he could be talking to. Could he have finally made a new friend? Being a single dad, it's hard for me to always keep an eye on our son, so I decided to go outside and check on him. When I went into the backyard, I was a bit confused because James was the only person back there. Was he talking to himself? I could have sworn I heard another voice. James, it's time to come inside. I called out to him. He came inside and sat down on the kitchen table. It was about lunchtime, so I decided to make him a turkey sandwich. James, who are you talking to out there? I was playing with my new friend. He said, smiling. I poured him some milk and continued to pry as any good father would. Does your friend have a name? Why didn't you ask him to have lunch with us? James stared at me for a moment before replying. His name is Laughing Jack. I was a bit taken back by what he had said. Oh, that's a strange name. Uh, what does your friend look like? I asked a bit confused. He's a clown. He has long hair and a big swirly cone nose. He's got long arms and baggy pants with striped socks, and he always smiles. I realized my son was talking about an imaginary friend. I suppose it is normal for kids his age to have imaginary friends, especially when he has no real kids to play with. It's probably just a phase. The rest of the day went by as per usual, and it was starting to get late so I put James to bed. I tucked him in, gave him a kiss, and made sure to turn on his nightlight before I closed the door. I was pretty tired myself, so I decided to go to bed not long after. I had an awful nightmare. It was dark. I was in some kind of rundown amusement park. I was scared, running through an endless field of empty tents, broken down rides, and abandoned game huts. The whole place had a horrible look to it. Everything was black and white. The prized stuffed animals all hung from nooses in the game huts, all with sick grins stitched to their face. I felt like the whole park was looking at me, even though there wasn't another living thing in sight. Then suddenly, I began to hear music play. The sound of Pop Goes the Weasel was being played on a squeeze box echoed through the park. It was hypnotizing. I followed its tune to the circus tent almost in a trance, unable to stop my legs from moving forward. It was pitch black. The only light came from a single spotlight shining on the center of the big top. As I walked towards the light, the music slowed down, and I found myself singing, unable to stop. The monkey chased the weasel The monkey that was rolling in fun The music stopped right before the climax and then suddenly the lights shot on. The intensity of the lights was practically blinding and all I could see was a dark silhouette shuffled towards me. Then another one appeared and another and another. There were dozens of them all coming towards me. I couldn't move. My legs were frozen. All I could do was watch as the haunting figures drew nearer. As they got closer, I could see that they were children. As I looked up at each one, I noticed they were all horribly disfigured and mutilated. Some had cuts all over their body, others severely burned, and others were missing limbs, even eyes. The children enveloped me, clawing at my flesh, dragging me to the ground, and tearing inside me. As the children tore me apart and I faded away, all I could hear was laughter, horrible, awful, evil laughter. I woke up the next morning in a cold sweat. After taking a few deep breaths, I looked over and saw that a few of James' action figures were positioned facing me on top of my nightstand. I sighed. James had probably woken up early and put these here. I gathered up the toys and made my way up to James's room. However, when I opened the door, James was sound asleep. I just shrugged and placed the toys back into his toy box and headed down to the living room. A little while later, James woke up and I made him breakfast. He was quiet and seemed a bit groggy, 
Perhaps he didn't sleep well either. I decided to ask him about the toys. James, did you put the toys in Dad's room this morning? His eyes shot up at me for a moment, then quickly glanced down at his cereal. Laughing Jack did it. I rolled my eyes and responded, Well, you tell Laughing Jack to keep the toys in your room. James nodded and finished up his breakfast, then decided to go out and play in the backyard. I went to relax in the living room and I must have dozed off because I woke up a couple hours later. Shit! I need to check on James! I was a bit worried. It had been over two hours since I have checked on him. I stepped out into the backyard, but James wasn't there anymore. I was getting nervous, so I called out to him. James? James, where are you? Just then, I heard a little giggle come from the front yard. I rushed through the gate, around to the front of the house. James was sitting on the sidewalk. I breathed a sign of relief and walked over to him. James, how many times have I told you to stay in the backyard? James? What, what are you eating? James looked up at me and then reached into his pocket and pulled out a handful of hard candies. This made me very nervous. James, who gave you that candy? James just stared at me, not speaking. James, tell Daddy where you got that candy now. James hung his head down and said, Laughing Jack gave it to me. My heart sunk. I kneeled down just to give him a look in the eye. James, I've had enough of this damn Laughing Jack thing. He's not real. Now this is a very serious situation I need to know who gave you that candy. I could see my son's eyes tear up. But Dad, Laughing Jack did give me the candy. I closed my eyes and took a deep breath. James has never lied to me, but what he's telling me is impossible. I made him spit out the candy and I threw the rest away. James appeared to be fine. Maybe I'm just overreacting, after all he could have gotten it from Tom and Linda from next door, or Mr. Walker down the street. Either way, I'm gonna have to keep a closer eye on him. That night, I put James to bed as usual, and decided to go to bed early myself. Suddenly, I was woken by a loud banging coming from the kitchen. I sprung out of bed and hurried down the stairs. When I got to the kitchen, I was horrified. Everything on the counters had been thrown off and on the floor and our dog Fido hung dead from the light fixture. His stomach was cut open and stuffed with candy, the same type that James was eating earlier that day. My shock was quickly broken by a sharp scream coming from James's room followed by loud crashes. I quickly grabbed a knife from the drawer and moved up the stairs with the speed that only a father whose child is in danger could have. I burst through the door and flicked on the lights. Everything in the room is knocked over and tossed on the floor. My poor son in his bed, crying and shaking with fear, a pool of urine staining the sheets. I scooped my child up and ran out of the house and went next door to Tom and Linda's house. Luckily, they were still awake. They let me use their phone and I called the police. It didn't take them long to arrive and I explained what had happened. They looked at me as if I were crazy. They searched the house but all they found was a dead dog and two trashed rooms. The officer told me that someone had probably gotten into the house and done this right before making a quick escape when they heard me coming up the stairs. I knew it wasn't true. All the doors were locked and none of the windows were open. Whatever was in my house didn't come from the outside. The next day, James stayed inside. I didn't want him to leave my sight. I went into the garage and found his old baby monitor and set it up in his room. If anything comes into his room tonight, I was going to be able to hear it. I went to the kitchen and grabbed the largest knife from the drawer and put it on my nightstand. Imaginary friend or not, I'm not letting anything hurt my little boy. Soon enough, night came. I put James to bed. He was afraid, but I promised him that I wasn't going to let anything happen to him. I tucked him in, gave him a kiss, and turned on the nightlight. Before closing the door, I whispered to him, Good night, James. I love you. I tried to stay up as long as possible, but after a few hours, I felt myself drifting off. Just as I lay my head on the pillow, I heard a soft noise coming from the baby monitor I had put on my nightstand. At first, it sounded like interference, kind of like a radio. Then it turned into a soft moan. Was James asleep? Then I heard it. The laugh from my nightmare. That horrible laugh. I sprung up from bed and grabbed a knife from under my pillow. I rushed over to James's room and creaked the door open. I tried the light switch, but it wouldn't come on. 
I took a step in, and I could feel the warm, thick liquid on my feet. Suddenly, James's nightlight came on, and I could see the absolute horror laid out in front of me. James's body was nailed on the wall, the nails piercing through his hands and feet. His chest was cut wide open, and his organs hanged down from the floor. His eyes and tongue had been removed, along with most of his teeth. I was disgusted. I could barely... I could, I could hardly believe this was my baby boy. Then I heard it again, the soft, desperate moan. James was still alive, my baby, my poor baby. In so much pain, barely clinging to life, I ran across the room and vomited on the floor. But my sickness was interrupted by a horrible crackle coming from behind me. I spun around while still wiping bile from my mouth. Then out of the shadows emerged a fiend responsible for all this horror. Laughing Jack. His ghost white skin and matted black hair hung down from his shoulders. He had piercing white eyes, surrounded by dark black rings. His twisted smile revealed a row of sharp, jagged teeth, and his skin didn't look like skin at all. It almost looked like rubber or plastic. He wore a patchy, black and white clown outfit with striped sleeves and socks. His body itself was grotesque and his long arms hanging down from his waist, and the way he poised made him look almost boneless like a ragdoll. He let out a sickening laugh, as if to let me know he was pleased with my reaction to his work. He then turned slowly around in front of James, and began to laugh even more at the horrific sight he has laid out. That was enough to shake me from my terror. I snapped. I rushed at the monster, raising my knife above my head, and stabbed it down. But as soon as a knife touched him, he disappeared into a black cloud of smoke. The knife passed right through him and pierced James's still beating heart, splashing warm blood in my face. I immediately fell to my knees, and I could hear sirens in the distance growing louder. My boy, my sweet baby boy, I promised, promised Daddy would protect you, but I failed. I'm sorry, James. I'm so, I'm so sorry. Police soon arrived to find me in front of my son, still wielding a knife covered in my baby's blood. The trial was short, insanity. I was placed in the Faropolis house for the criminally insane, where I have been for the past two months. It's not so bad here. The only reason I'm awake now is because someone is playing Pop Goes a Weasel outside my window. I'll talk to the orderlies about it in the morning.